Good morning. Today we're going to look at the Harlem Renaissance movement in the United States. So what was the Harlem Renaissance movement? This was a flowering of African American art, literature, music, and overall culture in the United States that was led primarily by the African American community based in Harlem, which is a part of New York City. Harlem, however, was not so much a place as it was a state of mind, the cultural metaphor for black America itself. So when did the Harlem Renaissance occur? Basically, in 1924, a magazine called Opportunity hosted a party for black writers with many white publishers attending. After this, you see this flourish in the African American movement, and it ends around 1929, around October 29, the year of the stock market crash and the resulting economic Great Depression. Now, the Harlem Renaissance is known also as the New Negro Movement and the Negro Renaissance, and it was an important cultural manifestation in the mid-20s and 1930s. Now, with Harlem, New York as its center, the Renaissance was an upsurge of new racial attitudes and ideals on the part of African Americans and an artistic and political awakening of these people. It was also partly inspired by the iconoclastic spirit of the times, where people thought they could do anything, live for today, live for the moment. The Harlem writers and artists were, like their modernist white counterparts, in quest of new forms, new images, and new techniques. They wanted to create new types of music, such as jazz. They wanted to create new types of literature in their poetry. And they, too, like their white counterparts, showed a lot of skeptical and disillusionment. What chiefly differentiates them from their other counterparts, however, was their view of artistic endeavor as an extension of the struggle against the oppression that they and their forefathers had been experiencing for decades. Now, the historical roots of the Harlem Renaissance are very complex. In part, they lay in the vast migration of African Americans from the southern part of the United States to northern industrial centers, and that began early in the 20th century and increased rapidly as World War I production needs and labor shortages boosted job opportunities up north. In addition to industrial jobs in the northern cities, World War I offered blacks the opportunity to serve in the military, although in segregated military units. So we see many of these people were also part of the Great Migration out of the South and other racially stratified communities. And as you can see, a lot of what was happening in the South basically made them feel unwelcome, where it seemed like there was bigger and better things, jobs, homes, employment, other things up North. So when we talk about the Great Migration, it happens around 1910 to 1930, and the African American population in the North rose by about 20% overall. Cities such as Chicago, Detroit, New York, and Cleveland had some of the biggest increases. And you can see almost all of this starts in the southern states and moves directly north, and some of the more western states like Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas actually moves south to California, excuse me, moves west to California. Now the factors behind the Great Migration, a lot of it was to avoid the racial segregation of Jim Crow laws in the south, but also most of the people were very agricultural and agrarian, and so with the boll weevil infestation in southern cotton in the late 19-teens, that forced people to search for other work. As people were also leaving for new World War I, blacks could take the service jobs that these new white factory workers had vacated. The Immigration Act of 1924 in the United States also stopped many European immigrants, which would cause a shortage of factory workers. And the Great Mississippi Flood of 1927 also displaced thousands of African American farm workers who had to search for jobs elsewhere.
So here we have pictures of what was going on at the time in the 1920s and why they might leave. So what are the effects of the Harlem Renaissance for us today? We look at it specifically on the music, the literature, and the art that was coming out during this period of time. Let's start with the music. Now, jazz had actually founded itself before the 1920s, but we see a huge flourishing of it at this time. Brass and woodwind instruments with trumpets, trombones, and saxophones, saxophones are playing the leading parts. Now, the music is characterized by intricate leads and accidentals. You're going to hear these saxophones, trombones, and trumpets play the melody and then actually play solos that might not even be written down. There are more complex chords and there are syncopated rhythms that you didn't hear in ordinary contemporary music. And with the improvisation of solos, it seemed like you never knew what the song was going to sound like next. You had a different sounding song every time. Now, at the time in the 1920s, what part of jazz was biggest? It was called the big band or the swing jazz era. No microphones at that time meant musicians increased the band size in order to increase the sound. You can see pictures, say for perhaps maybe Count Basie's orchestra that you have at the bottom of the screen where you have a lot of performers on the stage. They're also going to use composers such as Duke Ellington, Count Basie, and others who are going to write specifically for their band and specifically for the performers to play in their band, which did leave little room for improvisation in these particular big bands. Of course, like I said, some of these notable musicians that would be happening in the 1920s, not only did we have Count Basie, we're going to have people like Duke Ellington, uh, Louis Armstrong. Uh, we even have singers such as Bessie Smith that might be leading different orchestras as well. And the most prominent place in Harlem in New York City that most of these performers wanted to play at was a place called the Cotton Club. And that was on Lenox Avenue and 142nd Street in Harlem itself. Now, the literature in the movement. Now, against the background of increasingly artistic activity, three events occurred between 1924 and 1926 that launched the already developing literary phase of the Harlem Renaissance into the forefront. Not to say that the art and music still don't have effects as for today, but when we mostly talk about the Harlem Renaissance, we look at the literature from the period. Now, three events would help this come into being. First, Charles S. Johnson's Civic Club Dinner, which forged the link among three major players in the literary Renaissance. First, you have the black literary political intelligenista, the white publishers and the critics that are, in the, that are in the newspapers, and the young black writers who are creating the, the literature. 1926, you have the white novelist Carl Van Vetchen writing, and the book was spectacularly popular expose of Harlem life and helped create the Negro Vogue that drew thousands of sophisticated New Yorkers to Harlem's exotic nightlife. You have a popular white novelist talking about the movement and what Harlem's like, and everybody wanted to see it. Finally, you also have the publication of the literary magazine Fire, which is a group of talented young black writers, and they were spearheaded by Wallace Thurman. Now, these artists were declaring their intent to assume ownership over the literary renaissance itself. Now that they had their white counterparts kind of helping to expose their literature a bit more to the wider population, now you're going to see these talented young black writers take control of their own writing. Now, the Harlem Renaissance incorporated all aspects of African-American culture in its literature, and several different themes are going to emerge. When we look at the different common themes, we first start with the idea of alienation, where we're not exactly welcome and considered a complete whole American who could make the American dream their own. You also see this sense of marginality, where not many people understand your background and your culture. 
we're going to take the art and the music of the period and discuss it through our poetry and through our essays in the blues tradition. We're going to bring up the folk material that we had from the South growing up. Our previous generations were going to use their particular art and literature and make a new spin on it. And then, of course, we have the problem of writing for an elite audience, people who are expecting you to already have a knowledge about, knowledgeable background about the literary movement of the time. Now, through all these themes, the Harlem Renaissance writers were determined to express the African-American experience in all its variety and in all its complexity as realistically as possible. So when we talk about the notable writers of the Harlem Renaissance, we're looking at Zora Neale Hurston. We're looking at County Cullen. We're looking at Langston Hughes, who's considered the forefront or the most important writer of this age. Some of the notable artists of the period, you're going to see William Johnson and Lois Malou Jones. We're also going to see Jacob Lawrence. He's one of the later ones in the period, and he's actually going to gain even more popularity in the 1930s. We're also going to see a lot of jazz come through, not only in our poetry, but also in our music. And Archibald Motley Jr. has a tendency to make his paintings and his artwork specifically about the jazz movement. So why did the Harlem Renaissance end? Well, the Great Depression comes along after the October 29th stock market crash. Not everybody can afford to look at art, to write art, to create art. And so the Great Depression brings to the end a lot of different literary and cultural movements. The migration that's been going on since the beginning of the century, it's now had an entire generation or two. So it starts toning down and communities start settling even further away from these urban centers. You also start seeing fundamentalists, since we're going to have more of a movement back towards religion in the 1930s, they're going to curse the devil's music and the art. We don't like things that are new. We want something that's more traditional. And a lot of people might say the Harlem Renaissance never ended. It just evolved. For example, if you take a look at the music, the jazz music is going to evolve into rock and roll, into Motown and Detroit, eventually into hip hop, into rap in those urban centers in the 1970s and 80s. And then you're also going to see the sense of commercialism of that culture. You're going to see white artists and their white counterparts actually taking hold and mainstreaming the types of music, art, and literature, such as Elvis, the Gershwins, even Frank Sinatra. So what is the legacy of the Harlem Renaissance movement? It's a bit of a paradox, actually. We see art as a release and also contributing to tensions. The art is showing the complexity and the reality of the African Americans in American society. So it almost seems as if it's a relief to get it out there. It also, unfortunately, is going to contribute to tensions as they're starting to say, this is my life. This is what makes me different and unique. Some people are not going to like that. The white audience for the first time is going to see mainstream culture from a different sort of American society, and that's quite helpful. We also see the glorification and the sophistication of African American life and culture. No longer is it just considered a folk movement, but it's actually considered an integral part of the American literature movement. We also see a perplexing sense of optimism in the uh, Harlem Renaissance art. When we're starting to look at the oppression and how we have this sense of relief in our art, we also have this sense of optimism coming through. Now it's our turn to claim where we're supposed to be with everyone else. And that starts leading to the sense of black pride and the civil rights movement that's coming shortly after this Renaissance. And then, of course, at this time, it also becomes an international phenomenon as we see a lot of these artists leaving for France post-World War I, a lot of them going off to Paris to live, a lot of them spreading their culture across Europe and across the other parts of the world. 
Well, that'll do it for the Harlem Renaissance. If you have more questions about the Harlem Renaissance, or if there's any specific works of art, like you'd like to talk more about Duke Ellington and his swing bands, maybe County Cullen or Langston Hughes and their poetry, please leave a comment down below if you'd like me to cover more of the Harlem Renaissance. And as always, I'd appreciate it if you subscribed.